in this video we're going to continue our discussion around relationships between variables and confounding variables and independence between variables. And we're going to define a new concept, Simpson's Paradox. Let's do that in the context of a case study. Uh, this is admission data from University of California, Berkeley, and it's historical data dating back to early 70s. So this is based on a study carried out by the Graduate Division of University of California, Berkeley, uh, to evaluate whether there was a gender bias in graduate admissions. And in this particular data set, gender is defined as binary. That's how University of California was collecting data from the applicants at the time when this data was collected. So the data come from six departments and the release data simply labels them A through F. So we don't know what department they are really, but we know there are six of them. And we have information on whether the applicant was male or female and whether they were admitted or rejected. First, we're going to evaluate whether the percentage of males admitted, admitted is indeed higher than females overall. And then we're going to take a look at the breakdown by department. Here's what the data looks like. In our original data set, we have 44. 4,526 rows and three columns. So that's how many applicants we're looking at. Uh, we know whether they were admitted or rejected, what their gender was coded as male or female, and which department they applied to. So we can take a look overall at the uh, number of males and females. Uh, we can see overall that there are more males in the data set than females to begin with. We can take a look at the breakdown by department. So some departments are bigger than others. And we can also take a look to see at the overall admission uh, rate. So uh, 1,755 of the applicants were admitted and 2,771 of them were rejected. What can we say about the overall gender distribution? So we wanna calculate the probabilities. What's the probability that somebody was admitted given they're male? And what's the probability that they were admitted given that they're female? Here we've taken, uh, taken the, our data set and simply use the count function to get the, uh, the uh, frequencies that we need in order to be able to answer this question. And if we actually go ahead and calculate these, um, proportions. So the way I'm calculating it is after I get the counts, I say, okay, for the neck, for the remainder of this, I want to group the two genders coded in this data set separately. So we want to group by gender. And then for each gender, we want to calculate the proportion admitted. So that's the uh, number of people who fall in that particular category, either rejected or admitted divided by the sum of n, but remember that we're doing a group by statement here. So when we say sum of n, we mean the sum of the n's for females and sum of the n's for males separately. So we can see here that about 30.4% of the females and 44.5% of the males were admitted. So the answer to the question is the average, is the admission rate higher for males than females is, yeah, absolutely. That's what the numbers show. And here is that same information uh, visualized in a segmented bar chart where we can see that the green um, that uh, indicates the uh, admitted is uh, makes up a smaller uh, portion of the bar graph than uh, for females than for males. So with this information in mind, uh, let's take a look at the gender distribution by department. Okay, so this time we're going to add to our count statement one more uh, argument at the beginning, which is department. So we're saying we want to do the same thing that we did, but we want to do it once per department. It's a little bit hard to tell what we would do based on this particular output. We have some of the data we need, but not everything is showing up in one place. Uh, so what we might do is we might pivot the uh, table that we had wider so that we have a column per department. And so for each department, we can look at the females. And for each department, we can figure out what's the probability that somebody's admitted given that they're female. And similarly, for each one of the departments, we can calculate the same. Uh, here's Dorian Gray again. Uh, we can calculate the same proportion for males. And here is a visual kind of depiction of the those uh, calculations that we could go through. Again, uh, the green here indicates admitted and the pinkish uh, red indicates uh, rejected. So we can see, for example, that in Department A, 
uh, the proportion of females admitted among all who applied is much higher than in uh, than males versus when we look at department E, uh, the males is higher, although just by a little bit. So what we're seeing here is that either females are higher or they're lower by just a little bit. So if we just look at this picture, um, it might appear as though there isn't a whole lot going on in terms of potential gender discrimination. So here are the two pictures we looked at side by side. First one is admissions by gender and the other one is admissions by gender and department. They seem to be telling a slightly different story. So what happened here? We can take a closer look at the department. So here what I've done is for each of the departments, I have calculated how many females were admitted and uh, sorry, the proportion of females that were admitted and the proportion of males that were admitted. So in that department A, we were seeing a much higher percentage of females admitted than males. That's among the females who applied, what percent were admitted is what we're looking at. And in fact, those proportions are correct. But let's take a look at the columns uh, called N admitted and N applied. So in department A, 108 females applied and 89 of them were accepted. But when we look at males, 825 of them applied and only 512 of them were accepted. So what's happening here is that in some of the lo these large departments, even though of the females who applied, where that Berkeley is accepting a high proportion of them, there aren't that many females that apply compared to males to begin with. So to say that there's absolutely nothing of concern with regards to gender and graduate admissions would be wrong. But also the data does not necessarily support that every single department, uh, what was happening in every single department was gender discrimination at, um, at admissions. There is a bigger problem that clearly needs to be addressed here why are the distributions of males and females applying not more even? Like in some of the departments, for example, if we look at department F, where the proportion who are accepted, and it looks like a very selective department, they're not accepting a whole lot of people, the admission rates are pretty low, and the number of males and females who applied are very similar, and so are the number of females and males who are accepted. But in departments where admission rates are generally higher to begin with, they're clearly much bigger departments, um, we are seeing that the number of males who apply are a lot larger, and that's what's driving that when we look at the overall data, it appears as though the male admissions are higher. So what did we conclude as a result uh, of this. It is not that gender is not a concern in graduate admissions, but it is that depending on the question that you're asking and whether or not you consider this third variable, department variable, the conclusions you arrive at can be different. And that is what we call Simpson's paradox. So let's take a look at this, uh, you know, very simple graphic. We have two variables here, X and Y, and we've plotted them against each other. We're seeing two, uh, four dots going down here and four dots going down up top. Now, if I was to fit a line for these eight points overall, it would actually be an increasing line because we have to consider all of them at once. And if I was to think about what would be something that describes the pattern that I'm seeing of all the points at once, it is true that on average, um, as X is increasing, Y is increasing as well. But there is a third column in this data set, the Z column. So if I was to actually then color my points by that, we can see the distinction a little bit better. And if I was to say when I'm thinking about evaluating the relationship between X and Y, I actually want to keep in mind Z as well, then the lines that I would draw are very different. So when I think about the data overall, I'm seeing a positive association. But when I think about the two groups on their own, I'm seeing a negative association.
So not considering an important variable when studying a relationship can result in what we call Simpson's paradox. Simpson's paradox illustrates the effect that omission of an explanatory variable, so in the second example it was Z, in the earlier example it was a department, can have on the measure of association between another explanatory variable and a response variable. And the inclusion of a third variable in the analysis can actually change the apparent relationship between the other two variables. Um, so we've made a point of Simpson's paradox, but along the way, I've also used some R code to uh, calculate some of the counts and the proportions that we were using. So before we wrap up this video, I want to uh, take a quick aside to talk about the functions group by and count that we relied on so heavily as we were working with these categorical data. So what does group by do actually? Group by takes an existing data frame and converts it into a grouped data frame where the subsequent operations are uh, performed once per group. So here is the Berkeley admission data frame. And if I say we want to group it by gender, nothing changed in terms of the number of rows or number of columns or the presentation of the data, except that uh, this data frame has this um, attribute that it is grouped by gender and the number two in the square brackets indicates that there are two groups. So group by what does not do? It does not sort the data. That's what a range does. So if you want to sort the data by department or gender or something like that, we would be using a range in order to be able to do that. Group by also does not create frequency tables count does that. So if you actually want to take your raw data frame and turn uh, it into a frequency table to count the number of occurrences of particular levels of a categorical variable, you would use count. And when we have group data, we can then undo the grouping using the function ungroup. So here is how I had calculated the proportions of admit, uh, admitted um, proportions of admissions for males and females overall, but we can see that before, in order to be able to calculate that earlier, we said we're going to group the data by gender, and then we're going to calculate this proportion, and our resulting data frame is still grouped. So if I was to do more operations on this data frame, they would also happen uh, once per group for each of the genders. If I don't want that to happen, then I can say and specifically ask for the data to be ungrouped. It doesn't change the presentation of the data, but it does change subsequent behaviors because this particular data frame is not grouped anymore. Uh, count on the other hand is a shorthand. It's a shorthand for group by and then summarize to count the number of observations in each group. So instead of doing group by gender and then summarize to create a new variable called n that counts the number of occurrences for each of the levels of gender, I can simply say take the data frame and count the genders in it. The data that's the frequency tables that's presented to us look exactly the same, basically, right? But actually, um, there's a little bit of a difference between their behaviors. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that count can take multiple arguments, uh, just like summarize, uh, a group by and summarize can do as well. So we could say, I want to group by gender and then whether the, uh, the student was, or the applicant was admitted or not, um, and then do the summarization to do the counts this way, or I could simply tag along the multiple variables into the count function and get the same result out. When we do a summarize after group by, if you have your messages open in your R Markdown document, so you haven't actually uh, kind of suppressed them, um, summarize will actually give you this message. It says summarize regrouping output by gender and that you can overwrite it. So what does that mean? When we use count to do these two steps, summarize and then, uh, sorry, group by and then summarize, it ungroups after itself. But what summarize does, it simply peels off one layer of grouping by default, or we can specify a different behavior. So what this is saying is that we had taken the Berkeley data set and then we had grouped by gender and admit, and then we did some summarization where we uh, basically uh, counted the number of observations in each of the levels. And so summarize peeled off the grouping by admit, 
but left behind the grouping by gender. So if I was to do subsequent operations with this data frame um, without specifying any other behavior, the next operation would happen grouped by gender by default. So summarize doesn't want to do that silently. So it gives you this message saying that it regrouping the output by gender so ultimately currently your output is grouped by gender and if you're paying attention to the output you'll catch that anyway but it is something that's a little bit easy to overlook and then uh, subsequent results might surprise you as to why they're happening you might be thinking I didn't ask you to group anything by gender why are you still doing that and that's because you haven't indicated a different behavior Summarize function has an argument called dot groups where you can specify that behavior or you can go back to using the ungroup function as well.